In the last episode, we took a look at how we can use a shelf in this upper region of the workbench in order to optimize the use of space. But today we're going one step further as we take a look at this, a fully enclosed filament storage system. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So as I mentioned, today we are going to be taking a look at the filament storage and usage system. So this is not a final or complete design. This is the first prototype. It's indicative of what the aim will be, but it won't necessarily look like this on the final product. It should look pretty similar. Like I'm pretty happy with how this works, but it's not gonna be exactly the same, just so you know. I do want to start off just by thanking everyone for all the feedback that's been provided so far. It has been very, very helpful and I've got a huge list of changes and updates to make to make sure that this workbench is the best it can be. So stay tuned if you want to see what all those updates are about as they'll be coming up in future episodes. The enclosure is comprised of basically seven key elements. The frame, the panel material, the panel seal, the door seal, the door latch, a filament pass-through and spool holder. We start by assembling some of the extrusions for the enclosure to the frame and adding the seal profile into the extrusion. Next, we fit panels into the areas of these extrusions that won't be accessible later on. We can then enclose these areas where we fitted panels with the remaining extrusion and sealing profile to complete an open box. The doors are assembled separately and they're added as a single unit afterwards using a jig to hold them in place as they are, at the moment, quite heavy. Finally, we can finish off by assembling a spool holder, placing it inside and adding a bracket to hold the feed tube. The frame structure for the enclosure uses exactly the same extrusion as the rest of the frame at the moment. However, because it is quite thick and large designed for a large robust frame, it is a little bit overkill for the enclosure. And overall this makes the top of the workbench quite heavy. There's quite a lot of extrusion that goes into this top assembly. What I'd like to do with this top enclosure is to use a smaller size profile that's more suited to just holding a few kilos of filament, maybe 15 or 20 kilos, rather than the probably 60 or 80 or 90 kilos or something that this assembly could hold. It really is a little bit overkill. And as a result of being overkill and too strong and using too large extrusion, it is at the moment quite expensive, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So for the overall panel material, which obviously covers like front, back, sides, and kind of forms that box enclosure, I was looking for something that's sort of insulating, fairly easy to work with, and maybe clear, although I wasn't necessarily certain that that was what I wanted at the start. The first material I looked at using is dye bond aluminium. This is an aluminium composite, which has aluminium, or very thin aluminium on the outer faces with a polymer in the middle. Now, this is very easy to work with. It's easy to drill through and kind of use. Unfortunately though, it can be quite sharp and prone to cutting your hands. It's normally used in signage where it's kind of fixed to the wall and stays there. But for this kind of thing, where it's a DIY kind of solution, it didn't seem like quite the right thing. I also initially looked at bolting the panels to the outside of the extrusion by like just screwing loads of nuts into and around the frame. In principle, that kind of worked. Unfortunately, the number of screws which you need to hold it in tightly was kind of excessive. It took ages to put them in and became quite expensive. And secondly, it kind of rattled because there was no real way to make sure that that panel was really well screwed to the side in every single location. You obviously have gaps between the screws and the vibration there seemed to just cause the panel to rattle and was basically very noisy. The reason I looked at doing that initially is because I hadn't identified these kind of hidden fixings which keep the profile clear. So I didn't have that area to use. Obviously, once I'd found these fixings, which we talked about in the earlier episode, that whole inner profile now became available. So I found a seal profile and could just literally slot the panel in around the extrusion. And that has worked really, really well. One thing that I was concerned about with having a box like this is it kind of becomes a speaker. Like it is just a speaker box that could just amplify all the noise. Fortunately, because of the way that these panels are kind of soft mounted using the um, sealing profile, it doesn't seem to add to the noise at all. So I'm really happy with how that's worked. The material I'm currently using in here is a four millimeter clear PETG, 
So very similar obviously to your standard clear acrylic, but for me, this solution was a little bit cheaper. In the future, we may be looking at thinner panels in order to reduce the cost, and they'll probably do a fairly similar job to what these ones can. I've sort of covered the panel material and the panel ceiling all in one go there, but they kind of were interlocking features, so that's those two covered. The door seal was one of these critical things where you have the interface that needs to kind of open and close, but also seal at the same time. There's a number of ways I could have done the door seal, and there are quite a few different seal solutions that I looked at in order to achieve it. Sometimes you can have doors that kind of fit within the extrusion, so you have the kind of the body would be here and this will sit flush with that, and then you'd seal maybe between the two, but that became a really kind of convoluted solution. It used like more joints and more seal, and the seal that it used was quite expensive because it was like a bespoke two-part thing. That whole solution just became very complicated and didn't seem like quite the right thing, and it was quite expensive. So what I moved to is this kind of design where you have the frame basically just butts up against the enclosure that's already there, and you can't see it because it's not in the frame now. <laughs> but basically, the seal just goes around here in a big circle around the extrusion, and that allows you to seal the door against the rest of the uh, enclosure. In order to get a decent seal against the door, obviously we want something that's reasonably thick and some compression when the door is closed. So I've tried a few different thicknesses of foam to see which one works best. I found that the very thick one made the door difficult to close. The thin one kind of sealed at this end, but because the hinge was kind of a fixed distance, didn't really seal well on that end. But this one that was kind of the middle thickness turned out to be just perfect. It's a little bit tacky, so it requires a little bit of force to push it open, which is good because it means that when you have two doors with one latch, and you open the latch and open one door, this door doesn't accidentally swing open. Speaking of the latch, there were a number of available kind of off-the-shelf solutions which could have done a similar job on doors for extrusion. But they seemed to start at like 30 pounds or something. I was like, 30 pounds for a little plastic latch seems hugely excessive. So I decided to come up with my own solution. And fortunately it works really, really well and is super cheap, so that's excellent. What we've got here is basically a bit of threaded rod that's held into the extrusion with a hammer nut and a washer, and then a little 3D printed kind of uh, latch on the top, and you simply turn it and it forces them closed. It's absolutely perfect, it doesn't open, it can't turn. All you have to do, simple turn, and it opens. One-handed operation, super, super simple, and because it's a thread, you can actually adjust how firm you need that closed. So if you turn it a whole nother way, that's obviously a bit tighter. If you turn it another one, that's obviously tighter and tighter. It makes it a bit more difficult to close then afterwards. But the little ramp on the edge of the printed part means that it kind of compresses against as you turn it down. And I'm just super happy with how that latch works. It's very, very simple to do, very simple to assemble, and works exactly as intended. So the first spool holder that I actually made looked a little bit like this. Now this is a 3D printed version, but the final solution was intended to be a folded aluminium. We've got a number of bearings that would be here in order to obviously hold the filament, but a roller would be added across here in order to take the smaller sizes. At the front we've got a PTFE coupler which can hold the PTFE tube, which basically is a feed tube to take the filament from the spool to the printer without being tangled or anything in between. The problem is this PTFA coupler is facing the wrong way. So if you pull the tube, it can just carry on and that's not great. Whereas if you mount it this way, so pointing downwards, you can't pull the tube out. You can push it in, but you can't pull it out. The other downside of this design is that it was a fixed width. So because we've got these kind of cross beams, we can't change the width of this roller. So if all the filament that you use is kind of the really narrow, maybe 750 gram spools, then a lot of your enclosure, if you fill it with these, is gonna be empty space, and that's not really optimal. So this is the final design spool holder, nearly. We might not have these extra little feet on it at the end, but this is basically what it's gonna look like. It's very, very simple. You've got a couple of rollers for the filament, and then sheet aluminium both sides. The advantage of this is you can print these rollers at any width you need. If you need them extra wide, if you need them extra narrow, you can do that, any size that you want to fit the exact spools that you use. The only downside of this design at the moment that I'm coming across is that the bearings tend to be quite 
kind of thick and sticky and don't necessarily roll very well, especially when your spool is quite empty. Maybe that's one other thing that we can look at improving. One thing I should add is that one of the advantages of this kind of design is you can just kind of put it in here and you can slide it back and forth. It does have a little bit of rattle, but it, you don't hear that. Like it doesn't rattle when you're not moving it around. So that can just slide back and forward in here along the, along the rails. So if you've got a bunch of filament that you want to just kind of shift it all along, you can do that as long as of course they're not all going through PTFE tubes. The way I looked at doing the PTFE tube originally was to fit it between the kind of the frame and the door. So you have the frame and the door kind of closing onto it. I was going to try and squeeze the PTFE up the middle, somehow still sealing it against both sides. Of course, this became quite a convoluted and difficult solution, so I didn't end up going with it. But the reason I wanted to try is that I didn't necessarily want to drill through the extrusion. I thought, A, that might compromise the seal of the kind of the design overall. And secondly, I just didn't want to have this part being like different to all the others. But at the end of the day, it turned out to be really quite simple to just drill a set of holes through the extrusion. And that kind of solved all those solutions, all the solved all those problems all at once. It really was not a problem. You can just drill the hole very slightly larger than the PTFE tube, slide the PTFE up, tube up through the hole in the middle, very easy. If you want to add more tubes so you can just have loads and loads coming out, then you can do that. You just drill a hole, fit a bracket with a coupler, PTFE tube, job done, very easy. So in terms of overall improvements to the enclosure, Generally, I am very happy with it, but there are a few things which I think maybe could be different. First of all, it's designed to fit at the top here. This is not necessarily designed to go in as many places as the shelf because obviously its functionality requires the filament to kind of come out the base. I suppose it could come out the top, but it's designed to be fitted up here. It could be fitted at any height, so if you wanted it lower, you can do that. But if you wanted it fitted directly underneath a worktop, then you could probably do away with some of these parts. They just kind of get in the way, the doors probably wouldn't be appropriate. So you end up with maybe more parts than you need. There might be some adaptions needed, maybe just to the bill of materials in order to make this a little bit more adaptable in terms of where it can fit, but it can still go at any height. So it's still fairly versatile. Secondly, there are loads of joints in this box, even more than the rest of the frame. And because of that, it makes the cost quite impactful on the price overall. So I am going to continue to look at uh, how we can improve this joint design to reduce the cost as much as possible. Processing the extrusion costs money, These, the fixings cost money, and if we can try and maybe remove one of those factors, then we can still have a really good workbench but at a lower cost. The frame at the top here for the filament obviously doesn't need to be as strong as the rest of the frame. I'm sitting on the workbench at the moment, but I don't need to sit on my filament enclosure. That's even more ridiculous. To be honest, I don't even need to sit on the workbench, but it was fine and I'm talking about the enclosure. So that's the way it is. But anyway, my point is joints are very expensive. So I'm gonna to continue to look at cheaper alternative to see if we can still have a robust design, but at a lower cost. For any future improvements and upgrades, obviously this is kind of what I'm aiming at for the first release of this product. But down the line, I would like to have an active drying system. So basically a heater integrated into the enclosure in such a way that we can dry the filament out as we're printing it. We don't have to move it from one box to another or use a separate filament dryer, food dehydrator, filament dryer. So having a solution which we can either fit in here or be part of it and integrated is something that I'm really looking forward to try and do. So I'm kind of store my TPU in this enclosure and dry it out when it needs to be dry. The reason that's not coming with the rest of the workbench is I think I need to really focus on the safety aspects of that design and making sure it's, well, not only safe, but the panels don't melt and all this kind of stuff. So there's quite a lot more uh, interrogation that needs to go into that. So I want to finalize the whole enclosure workbench. We'll get that out as a product. And then later on, I'll start working on a heating system so we can actively dry the filament, but it will fit into the enclosure that's standard now. So if you get this, that will be an available upgrade rather than having to replace it all and start again. So that's it from me today for everything on the enclosure, the filament storage enclosure system for the Vector 3D workbench. Hopefully that's been really useful as information for you so you understand how it kind of works and what the design process is and you can 
with me. Look forward to some changes as we improve this to be even better than it currently is, because it is pretty awesome and works really well. Of course, please leave your feedback either in the comments below or in the feedback form in the description. I'm always really grateful to hear what you have to say, your opinions and any changes or upgrades that you think would be worth it to my design. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.